we're going to do one of my favorite things to do uh, today. And it's something that I want to teach you how to do uh, because when you tackle your problem text, once you've kind of made your mind up what you think, um, it's really important to look and see how does that square with what other people have said. And so what you call that is a history of interpretation. So you're going to come to a passage or an idea, and you're basically saying, this is what I think is why. How does my idea compare with what other people have thought about this text? So when we come to the Bible and difficult issues in the Bible, we're part of a conversation that's been going on for 2,000 years. Um, it's not like nobody's ever looked at any of these problems uh, before. And so we just want, believing in corporate wisdom, we just want to compare ide our ideas with the ideas of everybody else. And so that's what we're going to do uh, today. Um, and I've done this handout. And I can this is kind of my history of interpretation. Uh, I'm not expecting you to do it exactly the way I do it. I just want to show you how I do it. And then you can say, oh, this works for me. This doesn't work for me. So we've been looking the past several um, class periods on this idea of God's wrath against sin. And the most problematic text in that discussion is going to be Deuteronomy 7.2, that when um, God talks about Israel taking the promised land, he says, show them no mercy. And uh, that's going to play itself out, men, women, children, everything, uh, just completely obliterate them. And we've talked, at least if we've processed through that, as I've processed through it, I think that's part of the meta narrative of God uh, showing one way to get sinners out of the Garden of Eden, and that is total extermination. The problem with that is Judah has intermarried with a Canaanite woman and then incestuously uh, produced half Canaanite offspring with his own daughter in law. And so when God puts the spear in Judah's hand and says, kill the Canaanites, his entire clan is incestuously half Canaanite. And so what does God want, want him to do? And the idea that we've kind of tossed around in class is that uh, that was God's showing us that it isn't the Canaanites out there. It's actually the Canaanites in here. And God's solution was to incarnate and then suffer the Canaanite curse on the cross so that anyone could come. Um, so when the text says, show them no mercy, that's exactly what Jesus received uh, to get the Canaanite woman into the kingdom of God. That's kind of our idea. We want to see how that idea squares with what other uh, good interpreters have uh, done with the text. And so we're going to do a history of interpretation today uh, on Deuteronomy 7.2, kind of the worst passage. And so here's how I do it. Um, and uh, pull up Logos here. Um, all these books are going to be available uh, in the library. And I'm just going to walk you through how I would do it. So um, I'm using electronic versions of these books just because it's fast to do it that way. Um, but 
I start off, so I put these in order that I find useful. And I start off, if you find the thing Jewish stuff, there's an entry here called Mikra Oth Gedaloth. That's the Hebrew name of it. In English, they call it the Commentator's Bible. Um, we have this in the library. It's available through Amazon. And what it is, is basically the ACC only for Jews. So the ACC is the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, which is kind of somebody went through all the hundreds of commentaries written and collected kind of the best ancient ones. That's the ACC. Well, the commentator's Bible is that same exact thing for Jews. And since often I'm involved with difficult passages in the Old Testament, that's what I put as my first thing. And uh, I'll just get this where we can see it together. Um, when you go to um, Mikroth, Gedaloth, it works exa exactly the way the ancient Christian commentary on Scripture, that is, it's just collecting famous people's sayings. So a very famous Jewish commentator, Rashi, um, in his comment on Deuteronomy 7-2, which says, give them no mercy, he says, uh, one must literally not show them favor, pain, show them no grace. Now, just that right there kind of makes my ears perk up because I didn't recall that the word grace is being used there. If it is being used there, of course, it brings up this idea of Noah finding pain in God's eyes. Uh, so God is telling his people, show show those wicked sinners out there no pain. And it raises the question, well, the only reason I'm alive is because God has shown me pain. So I'm kind of intrigued. Now, um, before the computer age, when I did all this by hand, I would just type these quotes in. And that's probably what you'll have to do, you know, if you do the book uh, in uh, the library. But I tell you, I have gotten so lazy, you know, you copy the text. And then you go to your document, History of Interpretation. And so what I've done is I go down here to my notes, and I paste that note in. Um, what I like about it is it automatically footnotes it for me. So it's coming from this book, uh, Mikroth, Get a Loath, page 52. So I didn't have to type any of that. It did that for me. Um, I did look up the years Rashi uh, lived. So he lived 1040 to 1105. And so here's his note, show them no quarter. Now, when I do my notes, I use a style sheet and headings. And the reason I do that um, is because I've gotten a little lazy with this. If the electronics can do something for me, uh, I want it to do. And if you use headings, then you can rearrange your notes um, chronologically uh, by just dragging the heading under this navigation pane. And so I put the date, the guy lived, 1040 to 1105. And um, I'm just going to underline this because this is the part that I find interesting. And that lets me know the next time I look at this, this is kind of the significant um, idea. Is everybody with me, like what I'm doing? So I'm just, you know, we're part of a 2,000-year-old conversation. 
I'm just trying to hear voices from people. I want to hear the Jewish voices. This is a prominent Jewish voice. I've got it in my notes. Yeah. So when you do your text, it may be, I want you to do a history of interpretation and just show us as a class what you found interesting. Um, you know, what, what what have Jews said about this? What have um, the Mikroth get a loath? And we may walk over to the library and use it, just show you, but it's an interesting book in that it um, has every other page is English and every other page is Hebrew. So when you open it up, like one page is in Hebrew and one page is in uh, English, and because it's in Hebrew, the first page is in the back of the book, you know, so you open it up and it goes this way, but you can just follow the English and find uh, what these uh, uh, comments are. And we have the entire set uh, for the entire Old Te uh, Testament in the reference section in the library. We may walk over and look at that, um, but that's how you find this. And in 10 minutes, you can find basically um, two th you know, a thousand years of Jewish interpretation in English. So that's a, a real win. Uh, when I go to Mikroth Gedaloth, that's the only comment that they have on Deuteronomy 7.2, just Rashi's. They do have a comment on Deuteronomy 7.4 that caught my eye. It says, for they will turn your children away from me. And we talked about that whole idea that sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of uh, Adam and turning hearts away. And that kind of just made my ears perk up a little bit. I copied that note uh, as well. Uh, Ibn Ezra is another prominent uh Commentator, he's pointing out uh, the same thing. I copied that note. I pasted it in my notes here. Um, I used a, a style sheet to format. Um, do all of you know, know how to use a style sheet? Um, it's a fantastic thing. Um, you format one paragraph and then you come over here and say update this to match this section and then every time you need a paragraph to look like that uh, you just punch the note over here and also you can move your notes up and down so this is a great way um, to organize your notes in a way where you can see them uh, so that's one of the first things I look at, the commentator's Bible. The second thing I always look at is the ancient Christian commentary on Scripture. So this is this first one. It's in the library. Um, let me uh, show you how it works. Um, so you can see that the ancient Christian commentary on Scripture looks just like the uh, Mikroth get a loath in that it's just a collection of famous commentary. And so on our passage, um, uh, Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 11, they actually have an overview section. And this was kind of interesting to me. It, this is kind of the overview they give. The seven nations that the Lord promised to Israel prefigure for Christians the virtues which overcome innumerable vices. So John Cassian said that he lived 360 to 432. That's not the direction I would have gone uh, with this at all. He's seeing this as kind of an allegory and the Canaanites are kind of wickedness and so Christian virtues are driving those out. Um, Second comment, Christians should not destroy pagan idols without the consent of their owners. Now, is that the first thing that came to your mind when you read 
Deuteronomy 17. Like, why in the world would Augustine say that? Well, because in his day, when Christians were in governmental power, what did some people do with this drive them out text? Well, they reasoned, if we're Christians and we're empowered, what should we do? Let's kill the Canaanites, right? Is that what the meta narrative is teaching us? I don't think it is, because we're all Canaanites when it comes right down to it. But Augustine is struggling with the idea of Christian government and pagan religion. And so here's his quote. When you have received lawful authority, do all this. Where authority has not been given to us, we don't do it. Where it has been given, we don't fail to do it. Many pagans have these abominations on their estates. Do we march in and smash them? The first thing we try to do is break the idols in their hearts. And when they, too, become Christians, they either invite us uh, to perform this good work or else they get uh, in first with it before us. The thing we have to do now is to pray for them and not get angry with them. That's a pretty important text to me because it shows that while he's not struggling with exactly what we're struggling with, he recognized the whole uh, issue of is Deuteronomy 17 normative for believers? And he's going to say, no, that isn't how you should think about this passage. So... What am I going to do? Well, uh, I'm going to come to this text. Uh, I find that an interesting note. Uh, I'll copy it. Uh, some of these resources are, are available online, so you can do the same thing. Uh, I come down to Augustine. Uh, I call this Heading 2, so that's what does this. I added the date because I want to be able to arrange these chronologically. And then I pasted this uh, in, and good old Logos footnoted the resource for me, Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, Volume 3, page 287. Now, we've been doing this 19 minutes, and we've already gotten major Jewish interpretation and we're starting to get some major Christian interpretation. So, do you understand what I'm doing? We're, we're just, we got a problem, we want to get lots of voices. Uh, this is the way you get lots of voices. Uh, I'm looking ultimately for ancient, medieval, and modern uh, commentators to see what they say. Nearly always the next guy I look at is John Gill. Um, John Gill is just good. Uh, he's good at the history of interpretation. He's read everything. He organizes in a way that I found easy to follow. And John Gill is free on the internet, his entire commentary. Type in John Gill commentary on scripture, you'll find lots of websites that have um, his research. John Gill was the guy, Spurgeon was afraid to accept the call to the church because John Gill uh, had been such a great preacher and Gill had been dead for years uh, when Spurgeon went to that church. So like John Gill is, is like an incredible uh, uh, person. And so this is what he says. Um, when the Lord uh, your God shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them, men, women, and children, which was ordered not merely to make way and room for the people of Israel to inherit the land, but as a just punishment for capital crimes they had been guilty of, such as idolatry, incest, and murder. Now, John Gill right there 
in just the first sentence is helping me understand how he's understanding this, that when God told to kill the Canaanites, that he was justly doing that. That was, Canaanites were wicked people. Uh, wherefore, they were reprieved for a while for Israel's sake till their time was come to possess the land. They were at length righteously punished, which observes, abates the seeming severity exercised upon them. That shows me that Gil is wrestling with the same problem we all wrestle with. Make no covenant with them to dwell in their cities, houses, enjoy the lands, estates, or any condition, whatever. And though they did make a league with the Gibeonites, Joshua did that, that was obtained by fraud, they pretending to be not of the land of Canaan, but come from a very distant country. Uh, nor show them any mercy by sparing their lives, bestowing any favors upon them, or giving them any help and assistance in distress. The Jews extend this to all other heathen nations beside the seven. So uh, Gil is pointing out that if they're not living in the promised land, Israel extended them peace. It was just the seven. Wherefore, if an Israelite, as Maimonides said, well, who is Maimonides? Maimonides is the greatest Jewish commentator um, on the Old Testament. What does that show you Gil has done? He went to Mikroth, got a loaf, and read it. The only difference between uh, Gil and me is Gil read it in Hebrew, and I read it in English. It's like, oh my goodness, he is, so, he is such a great uh, scholar. Maimonides says, see, uh, should see a Gentile perishing or plunged into a river, he may not take him out nor administer medicine to a sick person. Hence, Juvenal, the poet, abrades them with their unkindness in civility and says that Moses delivered it as a Jewish law in a secret volume of his, perhaps re uh, referring to this book of Deuteronomy that the Jews might not direct a poor traveler on his way unless he was one of their religion, nor one a thirst to a fountain of water, and which led Tacitus, the heathen historian, to make this remark upon them that they entertained a hostile hatred toward all other people. That text right there shows me that this whole show them no mercy was something that even pagans wrestled with uh, during the time of um, the early church. He's signing Juvenal and um, Tacitus. So what I'm going to do in my history of interpretation, if I can get this all on one page, is I'm going to copy it. Make it a little smaller, it may be easier to copy. I found that helpful. I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to let you help me with something. So I'm doing this in order. I know Gil uh, is later. So who can, who can find for me when John Gill lived? You'll ha have to look it up on the internet. When did uh, John Gill, the Baptist uh, commentator on the entire Bible, when did John Gill live? When is it? I use these headings, so when I do heading two, you see how it made it nice like all the others? And as you see how it put the entry there? And then I'm calling this note two. Do you see how that made the format nice uh, for me? And uh, did you see how this uh, 
footnoted that this is from volume 2, page 31. So I'm going to do footnote text. And then good old John Gill, he actually gave me the quotes where all this appears. So a lot of people will say Maimonides said such and such, but they don't tell you where they got it from. And so there's no way to check it. Gill always puts where he got it from. And so I'm just going to tidy up my notes. Um, so he, he told me in Tacitus where he got it. Histories, book one, chapter five, paragraph five. It's like, how did he do that and run a mega church? That's what I want to know. Uh, but he did. Do you see what I've done now? Now I've got a major, he's not really medieval, but I call, I lump medieval pre-critical all together. So now we're 27 minutes into it, and I know some major Jewish translation uh, interpretation. I know some of the early church uh, interpretation, and now I know a major pre-critical commentator. And all I've done is check three books, right? So any problem text, you can do this. Just go uh, two volumes in the library. Go to the internet to find John Gill. Lots of uh, places have access to John Gill. Uh, and put it in your notes. Tidy it up a little bit. Um, uh, I tend to underline um, like the stuff that I find interesting. Um, And with something like Gill's comment, I not only found it interesting, but I found it basically was what I had found. And so I'm actually going to like doubly highlight that because that's important to me. Now when I go back to my notes, I can see right away what I found important. Um, I've done histories of interpretation for hundreds of passages. And when I teach that passage, I imagine I'll teach this passage sometime uh, in the future. I'm going to go to this set of notes that we made right here. And now I've got a history of interpretation, and I don't have to redo the work, right? Shortest pencils better than the longest memory. Uh, all right, well, uh, let's look at some others. So Luther is going to be good because I know Luther is anti-Semitic. Um, he's not good for being anti-Semitic, but he's good because he'll tell you what he thinks, and usually it's going to be either really good or really shocking, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is what Luther uh, says. Uh, if you go to a non-Catholic church or a non-Eastern Orthodox church, then your church uh, traces its roots back to uh, October 31st, uh, 1517, and the start of the Protestant Re Reformation. Luther started that. Um, this is what he said. You will show them no mercy. This word is frequently used in the book of Moses, Joshua, and Judges. In Hebrew, it's haram. In Latin, it's excommunicare. Then stems the term harem, or excommunication. In Greek, it's translated anathema. Since Paul, 1 Corinthians 16.22, says, He who does not love the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Then he says, uh, Maranatha. Thus the Gentiles were excommunicated and made anathema through the sword of the children of Israel when they were totally annihilated and destroyed beyond repair. God wanted to wipe them off the earth thoroughly with the definite verdict, even with a curse. Thus Moses properly calls harem or harem that no hope of life or safety should be left, that is, that which is devoted is profaned and accursed. 
Okay, that's his initial statement. I'm going to put that in my history of interpretation. So I come here, and you guys are going to help me again. Uh, I should have memorized the dates of Luther, but I always get it wrong. Uh, so you guys are going to help me uh, uh, look up. Uh, Martin Luther lived uh, 1483, maybe, to uh, 15-something. Can you help me? 1546. Is the 1483 right? Uh, so we'll call it heading two. Uh, we'll uh, do that, and that's note two. And um, it footnoted it for me as being from Martin Luther's works, volume nine page 82 through 83. Um, so he's pointing out kind of what we saw, that it's part of this harem. Now let's see what he says. I'm, I'm a little nervous about what Luther is going to say, but it um, says this, but even though those Gentiles were worthy of death, nobody, not even Israelites, was permitted to kill them unless promoted by a sure and evident command and word of God so that the pronouncement should stand in Matthew 26, 52. He who seizes the sword shall perish by the sword. And again, Romans 12, 19, vengeance of mine I will requite. And again, the Lord judges the peoples. Okay, so uh, Luther recognizes that even though uh, Deuteronomy 7, 2 says kill the Canaanites, that that's not something that Christians can embrace as their own. For he who gave life uh, can rightfully take it away from those who have sinned against him alone. Here, therefore, he used Israel for his service in order to execute his wrath upon their hand, just as from the beginning it was always his custom to destroy peoples through other peoples and to remove kingdoms through kingdoms when they had sinned, as he says in Daniel and in Amos. Behold, I come upon a sinning kingdom that I may crush it. But the swords of other people are different from the swords of Israel. In this respect, God uses their fury in a hidden judgment and crushes the ungodly through the ungodly. But the sword of uh, Israel is hallowed by an open and certain command of God so that with a holy and pure conscience, the godly destroy the ungodly and shed blood in a sacred act of religion. Okay, I, I find that interesting. That's going to go in my notes. So I copy it. Uh, I come to my Luther section. Uh, format it. It's going to footnote that as well. I'm a little OCD. I make all these uh, look the same. Um, so what else does Luther say? This is why he decrees through a sentence that the Amorites and the Canaanites be killed and does not permit the Israelites to ravage just anyone according to their desire. He accepted the Moabites. And of course, the Moabites, where Ruth is going to come from, and Ruth is the grandmother of uh, David, uh, accepted the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, people no less ungodly than the Amorites and Canaanites had been, to show that no matter what great sinners they are, still no one may kill them with a good conscience unless they have been given over and named by the command the will of God. For who is there among men who is not worthy of death in the sight of God except him whom God first comes with his mercy. That's the exact uh, thing that we came to. That's when that's when you start feeling good. You uh, come up with your own thing, and then you realize, oh, Luther held that same view. It's like, oh, might be on the right track here. Um, uh, the Jews, therefore, do not have reason for boasting 
as if they were the only ones among uh, whom men who were born to kill Gentiles, since they were chosen by God only that through their sword God might execute his wrath on Canaan. I find that a pretty good quote. It's going to make it into my uh, notes here. I'll format it and then format the footnote. So we're 36 minutes in and we've got five pages of notes in the history of interpretation and they're good notes. You know, we've got Augustine, uh, we've got uh, 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 Rashi, Ibn Ezra, John Gill, now we've got Luther, uh, all in just a few minutes. Let's just finish out this quote. Uh, Moses described beautifully here when he says, For God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession, as though he were saying, You have not chosen the Lord, nor have you been made slayer of these people because of your merit, but by the choice, calling, and command of God. Indeed, that you may know that before God there is no difference between you and the Gentiles. Hey, that's exactly the same thought that we had. Uh, take this to heart, that if you do not fulfill the word of God, do not slay these Gentiles, but enter in packs of marriages with them. Same wrath will await you also. The anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. The fact that the punishment is the same indicates that before God they are guilty of the same godlessness, that they may know that they are better than the Gentiles only by virtue of the word of God. Otherwise, none of the Gentiles would be so godless that the Israels would not be equal to them, either in guilt or punishment. I find that very, uh, a very good uh, comment. Um, so I come here, paste it in my notes, make sure I've got it formatted, uh, and then uh, good old Logos included Luther's footnote, or the editor's footnote. Um, and the editor says, Luther's lecture breaks off at this point. Possibly the remainder of the work was written only for print. It was not based on prior lectures. The lecture treats the allegorical meaning of idolaters and says in part, just as the Jews utterly destroyed the images with the physical sword, so we too have the spiritual office, namely the word by which we do away with images, even as the Jewish people did away with them, not outwardly, but inwardly. God demands of us spirit and faith, and then everything outward is free for us. Uh, if we wish to follow the law of Moses, we must act from freedom, not coercion. Otherwise, we will be guilty of all if from necessary, we keep one, as Peter and Paul teach. I'm a little confused by that note. He seems to be going in a similar way that Augustine went about destroying idols, and I'm not sure where they're getting that from the text. But um, So, Luther. Um, we've done Gill. If it's a really bad passage, I'll look at Poole. Um, Poole is kind of like a Gill light uh, to me. Um, he's very good. Uh, Spurgeon read, Spurgeon said if he could only have one commentary and it couldn't be Matthew Henry, then the one commentary he would take with him would be Poole. So it's a good work. Um, uh, Poole says this, no covenant with them to spare them or permit them to dwell with you in the land. Other nations had more favor, but these were for their great wickedness, for the good of Israel devoted to utter destruction. If I were doing this on my own, I might put that in my notes uh, to save time. I won't do it here. So we've done the ancient, we've done the Jewish, uh, we've done some medieval uh, what can we do now? Well, there are two things we can do. 
uh, and when I do this, this is exactly how I do it. Um, one is to start looking at modern critical commentaries. Um, modern critical commentaries are hard to read. Um, and often they'll have different assumptions about the Bible than most of us would share. Uh, most modern commentators don't believe in inerrancy. Most modern commentators don't believe that God put down every word in the Bible. And so when you come to modern commentaries, they can be good, um, but you've got to read them with a grain of salt. Um, so a series, we have this in the library, is um, the word biblical commentary uh, on scripture. Um, and this is kind of how it is going to go. Um, they give you the bibliography they've read first. So what do you notice about that? Here, can, I'll make it a little bigger so we can see. Uh, so this is the word biblical commentary, and um, this is their paragraph on um, uh, Deuteronomy 7. What, what do you notice about that, just right off the bat? <laughs> They've read a lot of articles. Uh, a lot of them are in German. Um, none of them are ancient. None of them are ancient. Okay, wow. Not sure what to do with that. Then Word gives you the, their translation. Um, when you enter the land, destroy the seven nations. Uh, when Yahweh, your God, brings you into the land, you are entering to possess, and he clears away the nations before you, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations stronger and greater than you. And he gives you, that is Yahweh, your God, uh, over to you. You will smite them. You must utterly destroy them. And you shall not make a covenant, and you shall show them no mercy. Um, I really don't know what these numbers mean. It's probably something to do with the meter of uh, Hebrew poetry, but uh, I don't know. So he's pointing that uh, he's reading the Hebrew accents in a certain way. So they have their translation, and then they have some very technical notes um, that only people really into Hebrew are going to find interesting. But then uh, he's going to have a section on the form, and he is saying that uh, Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 3 is a chiasm, where you have element, 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 main statement, C, B, A. So a lot of poetry will do that. I didn't know that that, that, that was the case. Whatever the middle one is, is the most important. You are a holy uh, people to the Lord your God. Uh, I didn't know that, so I think I'm going to put that in my notes uh, to remind me. So I'm going to come here, and I know the word uh, Bible commentary is like modern. So for now, I'm just going to call it word Bible commentary. Um, call it heading two. And I paste it in. And it kind of messed up the format. Let me just 
note to is treating that as a table for some reason. Uh, I'm going to go down and get the name of the guy who did it. So this is Dwayne Christensen, 2001. And I'm going to put, put the name here. Maybe I'll do it like this. Uh, do you see by doing the date, I can arrange it chronologically just by moving the heading? That's kind of a nice feature you get by doing it this way. Uh, I find it interesting that he thinks this is a chiasm. Let's see what else he has to say. Verses 1 to 4, the focus is on Yahweh's holy war against the seven traditional enemies of Israel, whereas 9 through 10 represent the character of the covenant God who is faithful to those who keep his commandments and will destroy those who hate him. The people are commanded to destroy utterly the enemies in the land so as not to be enticed to serve other gods. The innermost frame opens up a command to destroy utterly all Canaanite places of worship. Oh, I didn't pick that up. Five, that's where they're getting the uh, tear down the idols. Break down their altar. Okay, that's good. Uh, in the corresponding structure, 7 through 8 focus is on the reason God chose Israel. He chose them because of his love for them uh, and the promise he swore. Uh, so that's good because 7 says, I didn't choose you because you were better than these people. I chose you because I chose to love you. It, it was purely a matter of grace. Okay, that's exactly what Luther said. That's exactly what uh, Augustine said. Uh, so I find that uh, comment helpful. So I'm going to include that in my history of interpretation. Uh, I uh, format it. I format the footnote. And about now, I've put enough into this that I want to make sure I don't lose it, so I'm going to save it. Because uh, I don't want to have done 49 minutes of work and have lost that on this issue. Because I know I might forget to close this document and my computer will just eat it if I do that, so save it. In the central prosodic subunit, I have no idea what that means. The numer uzvexel is to mark the center or turning point. That has some to be some kind of German thing doing with the chiasm. The people are commanded to remove all the places of worship. Um, in the larger prosodic structure of 7, 1 through 11 as a whole, the first half tends to be negative. Uh, the midpoint is Israel's status. Okay, that, that may be helpful. All right, and then he's got a separate uh, comment uh, section. Failure to destroy the previous inhabitants would result in eventual disaster because of the temptation to serve other gods. The inhabitants whom Israel uh, were instructed to destroy consisted of seven nations, which are probably traditional in nature. Uh, see the excursus, holy war, and celebrated event in ancient Israel. Some of these people have been identified, though cautions should be exercised in matters of detail. These are traditional folk 
who constitute paradigmatic enemies within the context of cultic celebration for detailed discussion of parallel texts on the seven nation seed driver, manly, etc. Okay, so that's an interesting quote. Tell me what you come away from this modern uh, commentator uh, and my modern um, modern note on the text. What do you come away with it from, from that? Compare his clarity with John Gill's clarity. What do you come away with? Who's clearer in your mind, a clearer writer, John Gill or Dwayne Christensen? Gill gets my vote all day long. Christensen read everything German. Gill read everything Hebrew. Who are you going to listen to? Gill gets my vote. I think Gill's a better scholar than Christensen. And I think Christensen is a perfect example of a modern scholar, but modern scholars are committed to modern scholarship. And it's only the odd exception who will ever read anything before. And I think that cripples us when we do that. Um, there are lots of things in the text that, um, okay, so if I were doing this by myself, you know what I would do about right now if I were home? I'm a little tired of doing commentary work, so I've got to come up with my five-minute break. Do you have a five-minute break that you use when you get mentally tired? Do you, uh, Nathan, what's your five-minute break? Oh, play a prank or, yeah, what you're doing, you're clearing your mind, right? Do you know what my five-minute break is if I'm home by myself? I'll get my electric guitar. I'll turn it up incredibly loud. I'll put some blues on, and I'll play with it um, for five or ten minutes and uh, I found the oddest thing about me and playing the blues and that is the louder I turn up Stevie Ray Vaughan or Eric Clapton the better I sound <laughs> I don't know why that is but uh, I don't know there may be some kind of uh, sp <laughs> spiritual lesson here but when I get tired that's what I do I take a five minute break uh, I don't surf the internet because that five minute break will turn into a 50 minute break. Uh, so I find something that I can do that will clear my mind because if you do this too long it'll just, I don't know, become a little overwhelming or at least it does to me. Uh, so I do something uh, um, cl clear my mind then I can come back at it. Uh, and that's what we did just now. We told a joke or something, you know, and we cleared our mind. We can go back uh, to work. Now, you can see on your sheet that I've listed um, some other modern commentaries, okay? So the Hermeneia uh, commentary that's an English commentary, but it's translated from the German. So if, if you want to know everything anybody has ever found out about this passage, any kind of parallel text, Hermeneia is where you're going to go. Um, the ICC uh, is kind of a lighter version of that, but uh, international critical commentary, and all these are in the library. The sets are in the library. Uh, they're good. Um, 
Anchor Bible Dictionary, uh, edited by Catholics, but uh, there are critical scholars, so it's a very critical thing. They kind of differ, so you have some really good ones like Joseph Fitzmyers, uh, one on Luke, uh, Raymond Brown's one on John, uh, and then you have some that aren't so good. So it's kind of hit and miss uh, with the Anchor Bible. Um, in I, NICOT, uh, New International Commentary on the Old Testament, that's an evangelical work. Uh, more, more kind of in line with what we believe, but still a little bit higher critical. Uh, New International Commentary on the New Testament. Uh, so all of those are good places. But if I were doing this on my own, I would want to change gears slightly. And that is, uh, give me the quick, uh, you know, uh, the, the two-sentence summary uh, here of, like, what different people um, have believed. And I start going to study Bibles now, if I do that. And there's some really good ones. So the Faith Like Study Bible. Um, these are Logos people who've done this. Uh, you must utterly destroy them. The Greek concept of harem, which is evoked in the Hebrew text here, meant designating someone or something as sacred property. This designation often involves destruction. See the note on Joshua 6.16 and compare the note on Deuteronomy uh, 2.23. Uh, this involved treating an enemy as a sacrifice to God. The sacrifice meant these enemies were God's property and thus ineligible for any other relationship, ruling out the possibility of a covenant with Israel. Okay, Faith Life Study Bible. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to come down to my notes. Uh, I will uh, put in... Uh, Faith Life Study Bible. Uh, I'll put my note. I'll format it that way. Maybe I'll indent that so I'll know it's a note. I've got my uh, footnote there. Um, 2016. I'm going to put that so I can get these in order. Now I've got uh, one major good study Bible note. Uh, if I'm doing this on their own, on my own, I'm also going to look at the ESV study Bible. Very good uh, study Bible. Um, devote them to complete destruction. Israel's covenant with God is exclusive and Thus, covenants with other nations are prohibited. No mercy. Now, that's the second person who said that, and I didn't recall that. I'm, I want to look at the Hebrew of it now and see if it actually says no grace. Uh, you will assign them to harem. You will not. It is the word grace. You will not grace them. Ooh, look at this in um, um, the Septuagint. You will not uh, show them Eliao. And do, uh, any of you who've taken Greek, do you remember when we memorized uh, the um, um, Sermon on the Mount and Jesus said, um, Blessed are the Eliamones because they will be Eliathason tied. Okay, I'm now I'm interested. I'm really interested in this. So uh, if I can copy this. And it reminds me that I should have done this first because if I had done this first, I'd probably be thinking better thoughts right now. Uh, 
I would come down here and uh, maybe call this text and I'm going to underline those and I'm going to underline this. Sorry, I just realized I'm having a geek moment. Sorry. But it's going to help my notes. It's going to help the next class, right? Um, Show them no mercy. Inhabit Israel's promised land. Uh, they are being punished for their sins. Gil said that. Uh, God of justice is using Israel as his executioner. Any mercy shown to those whom God, God is judging will not only compromise God's punishment, but make Israel vulnerable. I find that kind of... Uh, Helpful. Uh, we'll go down to here. Uh, we'll call this ESV. Do heading you know, what, heading two. There's the quote. It's uh, 2008. And. I can put these in order by just moving that up now. Uh, and I've got my history and interpretation. Now, do you see what we just did? We took an hour and we got major Jewish interpretation, early Christian interpretation, pre critical interpretation, a critical commentary, and two study Bibles. How am I feeling about my position now? I'm feeling really good because none of those works mention Jesus receiving the harem of God as the Canaanite king, right? Taking the place of the Canaanites. None of them explain the idea of exterminating uh, the Canaanites as a microcosm of God driving sinners out of Eden. Uh, none talked about how the no mercy was shown to Jesus and that the God of grace who justly would judge. But L Luther and Gill uh, hint at it, um, but none of them emphasize that uh, to, for God to get us back uh, into the Garden of Eden that Jesus had to receive no mercy. Uh, and none of them explained that all Jews are half Canaanites. So I'm feeling pretty good about my explanation because I'm not out of accord with what other people said, but I'm certain mine's better than theirs. And it's better not because I read lots of German articles or anything else. Mine's better because I read the text. Odd fontes. Go to the source. Don't be a secondary scholar. Be a primary scholar. Read the text. The Bible sh sheds a lot of light on commentaries. I love that statement. The Bible sheds a lot of light on commentaries. So, questions or observations about what we did, how we did it, uh, why we did it. Do you feel like, in terms of your own passage and your difficulty, that you have some tools now to find ancient, medieval, modern commentaries? Do you understand about standing on your own two feet first, that is, doing the text, coming up with your own idea, and then in um, uh, secondary uh, sources work, you're kind of comparing what you're doing with what other people are doing. Um, so that's what I want you to do. You may not find the thing, you know, where you say, this is it. But my hunch is that you're going to be leaning in the right direction. 
uh, when you tackle your passwords. So that's what we'll do. Uh, next time we meet, um, we're going to tackle some eschatological text, and we're going to do lots of them. So ultimately, we're trying to get it, the one Carlos is interested in in Second Thessalonians. But to get there, we're going to read the eschatological discourses in uh, the Gospels. We're going to read uh, Revelation, and then we're going to try to put all that together in a way. And we're going to see where it takes us. So I'll see you after uh, the break. <laughs>